Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to, uh, I guess, the second afternoon, the final afternoon of this conference. Hope you've had a good lunch. Those virtual sandwiches were rather tasty, weren't they? Still, we're now here to talk. <laughs> My name is Mal Burns, and we're going to be looking at the sort of, um, oh, the future and the past and sort of everything mixed up, really, in the light of the current chaos in, uh, I don't like using the N-word, I've gone back to using the word cyberspace, but I think if I say the N-word, you'll know what I mean. And um, yeah, so we called it Back to the Future. Never heard that expression before. I was very pleased with that, I was. Anyway, anyway, joining me. Uh, for this adventure, so to speak, are two people who certainly if you've ever been in Second Life back in the day and stuff, you you will definitely know. Um, first of all, Dr. Fran Bancock, I call her Dr. Fran. Um, uh, yep, yeah, I'm going by her tag. She's a woman of many names, actually. <laughs> but um, yeah, she's been involved in many conversations recently and she's very familiar with masses of virtual platforms. She's uh, active on uh, Clubhouse. She's active with us in um, Sansa. She's active in Vicadia. And those are just the ones we know. <laughs> so welcome, Fran. Thank you very much, Mel. And thank you so much for asking me to be on the panel. And it's a delight to be with you and Dusan and so many people in the audience that I recognize. Back to you, Mel. Thanks. Exactly. It may be open soon, but all the cool people are here, as they used to say. Uh, yep. uh, yeah, and um, also we have Duzan Reiter, uh, otherwise known as Doug Thomason, but I'll be coming Duzan is the name I'm most familiar with. Uh, many people probably know him as the producer of uh, an acclaimed show that happened in Second Life years ago now uh, called Metanomics. Another meta name, I'll have you know. <laughs> we had meta music and a whole load of things back then, um, which uh, Bayo Sellers used to host. And, um, you know, it, it, basically it was an interview show with some pretty prestigious people. And um, I, um, currently, uh, Duzan has appeared again, should I say, in the Twitter streams and uh, whatever, <laughs> commenting, comment, commenting on sort of what's going on now. And actually, I noticed it quite a few times making the point that we did it years ago, didn't we? So uh, welcome, Dizan. Thanks. It's great to be here, Mel. It's like an old homecoming, seeing so many familiar faces. Fantastic yes. to be here. It is indeed, actually. I mean, so I've, 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 while I was trying to dig up people to come on these panels and things, you know, it's sort of, it's, it's funny how a lot of um, the old timers, I guess, have sort of reappeared, you know. Um, no, uh, while doing other things, and um, anyway, um, more on that later. Let's um, I'll just let you both in turn give a brief um over overview of uh, what you what you've done, um, in brief that is, and how you, in very very general terms, see this sort of future panning out for virtual worlds, metaverse, or cyberspace, whatever you want to call it, and um. I'm, I'll start with I'll start with you, Dizan. I think. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> On the um, spot. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I feel like, isn't it great that the kids? I'm going to call them the kids. Isn't it great that the kids are so excited about things we've been uh, working on for 15 years? I mean, back in the day, there was metanomics, which you talked about, and we did such uh, interesting work. I mean, we did a project. Uh, uh, with the U.S. military, actually, to help military veterans recover from uh, military recover from amputation, and we did that in Second Life, and it was called uh, the Amputee yeah. Virtual Environment Support Space. We did some stuff in Second Life with U.S. Bank, uh, just all kinds of like really cool, interesting projects back in the day, and it's it it felt like there was a very long winter when we went off in two directions. We either went off into social media. Yes, that's right. Gentle Heron and Virtual Ability were involved. They were just amazing. I remember, oh God, what, what a great project. And I, by the way, this is, this is the first time that I've had proper back chat in a really long time. So I'm so excited to have back chat again. Um, but it's, you know, we, I think there was this kind of long winter for virtual worlds and the metaverse. I still call it the metaverse because my blog was called Dustin Writer's Metaverse. And we went off in two directions. You know, we went off in two directions. Uh, I think virtual reality, uh, learning about that new affordance, and then social media. And I think, in many ways, kind of social media won 
the short-term battle, but as Zuckerberg's shift back to Meta has shown, yeah. the long-term war is still going to be fought in immersive spaces. So the types of projects I'm working on now, I'm back to blogging. Uh, I'm doing a little bit of kind of work with uh, uh, the Open Metaverse um, Interoperability Group, which I know, Mal, you're involved with a little bit. Uh, yeah, we some had project. Uh, yeah, I had them yesterday, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've got a big project that I'm launching with uh, avatars, and I'll use the I'll use the dreaded NFT word. Um, oh, and okay. Yeah, so we can go that direction too, if you like. Um, anyway, lots of I've actually got lots of projects going on up. It's just a, it is an exciting time, and it's interesting to me. And I'll just kind of throw this out there, and then pass it over to Fran. It's interesting to me that um, to try to parse which lessons we need to bring from the past into the moment now, and which are my old preconceived notions about what the metaverse should be going forward. And I think that's been my journey over the last year, is really thinking about, are those old ideas that I had 10 years ago, are they still relevant? And uh, uh, that, that I think is the challenge for me as an old timer. I think uh, I've faced some of the challenge for all of us, I think. I mean, it's very important. And it's not just to do with this business we're involved in here, so to speak, um, but life in general, you know, being open to new things and being willing to change your mind as time goes by. I mean, the perfect example at the moment is probably Philip Rosedale, who, you know, at the moment he's sort of... Uh, He's sort of telling people, you know, you don't really need avatars, <laughs> you know. Um, some of the messages he's giving out are the exact opposite of the ones he gave uh, gave out when he was, um, you know, CEO of Second Life. But, um, you know, it's all tempered by what's happening now. Now, um, Fran, uh, you also mentioned, I guess it was before we came on air, that um, we, we'll come back to NFTs a bit later, but... Um, you, for example, have been hopping around all over the place and you have been in um, uh, the helmet only job <laughs> of uh, well, Facebook Horizons, isn't it? And um, I gather you may not be there much longer because you've been sort of uh, encountered so many screaming kids and stuff. Um, you know, um, less of a welcome back, but now it's been opened up, you know, is it, is it, is it like the Facebook type, you know, madness? Well, um, I don't know about that, Mal. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, we have to give it a little bit of time to see what it's going to be. And, you know, I'm someone who's like never on Facebook. The only reason I have a Facebook yeah. account is because I own a Quest 2. But um, <laughs> my my interest in, you know, you know, I started out like most of us here in in Second Life. And, you know, you mentioned Philip Rosedale. Philip Rosedale was my North Star. And the reason why I moved from Second Life to High Fidelity. How many of you remember High Fidelity 3D? Oh, yes. Okay, so yeah. Philip was you, so you gung ho. Sorry. Yes. I was, I was in Alpha Perfect. Yeah. yeah, I was in there like a few days after it opened. Um, yeah. Philip was so gung ho on the idea of virtual reality and head mounted displays that the original High Fidelity did not even have a chat feature. You yeah. were, you had to, you know, that was added later after users screamed and yelled and begged and pleaded. But Philip was so up on this. And what Philip has learned over time is that um, a people want to be able to chat and text um, and that um, maybe the HMDs are not really comfortable. For those of you who, you know, I still wear my Vive and my Quest 2 and I can't do it for more than an hour or two, you know, before I feel uncomfortable. So that's not really a way to do it. But High Fidelity had things that um, no other virtual world had. And that was uh, the, the big issue. And this is where when people talk about NFT, and Bitcoin and, you know, and cryptocurrency and all that stuff. If you can't get more than 10 people into your world to look at the things you're selling, what's the point of having a business? A uh, high fidelity was able to have an, almost an infinite number of people, almost like Snow Crash or um, Ready Player One. 
Um, so, you know, that technology lives on. Um, Mal mentioned Berkadia. I'm active in that. That is an open source world. Um, you know, we I'm had, also. Uh, we had Dale, yeah, we had Dale here. here. Yeah, I was here for yeah. Dale's uh, talk yesterday. Um, so that's an open world. Um, and, you know, I, I'm starting to lose my train of thought, so I'll shut up. But um, but the thing is, I'm a hobbyist. I'm not here to make money. And, you know, I'm fine. You want to do NFTs. You want to do all this stuff. That's really okay with me. Um, I, you know, I I really love Arcadia. I also spent some time in Sansar, which was supposed to be Second Life 2, and is on life support right now. Um, for those of you well, who I, don't I, know, I, yeah. I join you almost every, it's, it's Tuesday evening, isn't it? We normally meet up in San Sol mm -hmm. for the uh, open mic. But um, yeah, a lot of discussions are, is it still going to be here ne next week? But, in case uh, you yeah. don't know that all of the devs and the staff from Sansar are on furlough. So there's, I mean, the, the thing's just running on its own and there's no, there's no staff there. But um, I've spoken quite enough. I'll turn it back to you, Matt. Sure. Um, right, I'm losing my chain too, and that's not on. I'm the host. <laughs> um, right. Um, yeah. Um, now, Dusan also mentioned also in the back chat first. Oh, oh, earlier on about NFTs. Now, I'm not a big fan of NFTs. Um, I call them non fungible trinkets, <laughs> as opposed to whatever the T normally stands for. Um, it seems to me, I mean, there is a good use for things like blockchain and stuff I can see for like security of passwords, security of wallets and things like that, uh, that may pan out, although the Ethereums and stuff seem to be more, largely governed by major banks these days anyway. It's like, you know, the traditionals moved in to the virtual. But all these people bringing up, you know, it seems to me that people can, you know, find an old GIF of something they did years ago and then turn it into an NFT and sell it for a fortune. <laughs> but <laughs> half, the, half the time, these intangible goods are just that, you know. If somebody comes around to visit me in the real world, which is unlikely with COVID going on, of course, but I can't sort of show them like a painting on the wall or get a book off the shelf and say, you know, this is a prized possession of mine and God, this cost me two million bones, dude. Um, <laughs> what do I do with an NFT when I've got it? Apart from go on Twitter and say, hey, I've got an NFT that sells for so much. Is anybody going to buy it? And uh, I think Philip again mentioned, that, um, uh, you know, it's likely that a lot of these things that are selling for a fortune at the moment are just going to be worthless in a few years. Because they're not they're not things that in any way are going to retain their value. Um, there's been in the you know social media recently. There's been reports of um, oh I don't know some guy bought you know, spent a colossal amount on an NFT of a virtual yacht. And was it you, Dusan, that actually pointed out the same virtual yacht was available in Second Life for pins? <laughs> I don't think it was me, but I think I think we're misrepresenting what NFTs are actually. Uh, yeah, carry on. G give me a little bit about NFTs and so, yeah, from your point of view. Uh, oh, I'm I'm losing you, Dizan. Your voice is breaking up. Is it just me or? Uh, okay, um, Dizan, your voice is actually breaking up a little bit. So we'll maybe give it a second to see if it's um if we can get a stronger connection um, again. Meanwhile, I'll, I'll, I'll move to, to Fran. Have you, have you got any real thoughts on NFTs at all? Yeah, I, I oh, yeah, can you hear me? Um, I yeah, have, you're uh, fine. Yeah. Okay, uh, I, have, I have mixed thoughts. I think that, you know, there is a lot to say about buying art that's really art that you can own. But if I'm buying something that's just a certificate to prove that I have ownership, um, I just saw someone paid $650,000 for an, uh, an NFT yacht. And yeah. in response to that, I, po I posted a free download from uh, Sketchfab to the person who posted it. I said, how about this? It's free. Um, 
you know, and I tend to get snarky about that, but I do own in, you know, in, in full disclosure, I own some Bitcoin, Ethereum and some Dogecoin. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I think that there's a lot to be said for having, getting the banks out of bank, out of money systems and that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, if I make something in the virtual world, I still have stuff selling in Second Life. I've never charged more than 25 Lindens for anything that I make, um, you know, because I want it for the newbies. Um, yeah. But, you know, I can sell that infinitely. When I'm 100 years old, I can still be selling the same item because I don't have to make it again. So some yeah. of that, you know, some of that is a little bit unfair. If it's a one of a kind, yay. You know, but I also own first editions of books. And, you know, that's not an NFT. That's a real thing. Um, I don't know. I think the verdict is that it's very hard to mint an NFT um, there are some issues around how much energy it uses. All of those things need to be considered. I yeah. think it's a it's something in its infancy, and we don't know yet. So my answer, my long winded answer is I don't know. I think what's we maybe oh, do we have my for. bandwidth back? I'm not, I've been yes, trying. You know, you it's know. the usual. It's the usual open sim toggle. All your settings. <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, okay. I well, think, welcome. I think, I think, Let's have your I think NFTs. Uh, are sort of misrepresented because they're confused with two things. They're confused primarily with the art, which is where NFTs, I think, began. Um, and I would I would propose that some of that as art, like the work that people is doing, truly is worth that value. Whether you agree with the way of transacting, you know, I mean, that's fine. We can debate that. But I think the misunderstanding about NFTs, there's two things. One is the spec, the rampant speculation. And we saw this in Second Life. We saw it back in the day of telehubs when people were bidding crazy amounts for land. And land is basically servers, and servers are basically an infinite commodity. And so that, yeah. you know, I think there's this artificial speculation around scarcity. But the thing I find exciting about NFTs is that they are programmable in the same way that Philip Rosedale invented the prim. If you don't relate to NFTs coming from Second Life or OpenSim, I would propose that you don't understand what NFTs make possible because what it makes possible is the model of the prim applied on a global scale across the entire internet. When you look at things like yeah. Ethereum, Met, uh, Meta, Metaplex, and the way that they're extending the utility, yeah. Uh oh, have you gone again? No, not again. Oh, no. Oh, no. Come back, too soon. Oh, you came, you came back, and you were so clear, and now you've <laughs> faded again. Oh dear, we're going to have to keep but, jumping back. But, so but, if you get back here. Things about, yeah. One of the things, yeah. though, about this is that what Dusan is saying is a good use case for NFTs. Yeah. There are people, any th time there's something new that people can exploit, they will. So it's really a caveat yeah. emptor. Buyer beware. Be yeah. careful with what you're doing because there are people who will take your money and run. Yeah. Yeah. That's and it's right. very much the new thing, isn't it? You know, I, mm -hmm. I heard a reference on one of the posts to snake oil merchants, <laughs> virtual snake oil merchants. There are also uh, honest dealers in, you know, that really yeah. are selling, you know, priceless, one of a kind things. And, um, you know, I but, think but people I th have to be careful consumers. Yeah. Am I right I in think thinking? We, I th that, oh, so yeah, welcome back, Susan. Yeah, I'm sorry. I keep cutting it. I'm trying to pair it with my uh, pair it with my phone too. I'm in a, I'm in a Miami Beach where I just uh, where I'm on in unreliable Wi-Fi, unfortunately. Uh, I think there's okay. three bigger trends. Maybe just to put this a little broader, I think one of the trends is that the model of the prim, where you are able to assign ownership and a value, whether that value is highly speculative and overpriced. I think over time that will trend back to what Fran was saying. The price will come down. You'll be able to buy NFTs for a dollar. They're going to figure out the environmental costs. They're going to be able to figure out gas fees. That's so. That's one trend. Oh, and I've been logged out of the sim. 
We can hear Sorry, you. Um, we can hear you anyway. We'll just imagine uh, you'll okay. <laughs> carry on. And I'll, I'll log myself back in. So uh, one of them is, yeah. you know, the concept of the pram being applied at internet scale, I just think is so exciting. I'm not yeah. excited about the speculation, and I totally agree with, with buyer beware for sure. The second big trend, I think, and Fran also alluded to this, was that headsets are very uncomfortable. But that's going to change, I think, within the next five years. I think that you'll have a relatively comfortable headset that you can wear for, you know, more than an hour. And that that will start to blur into augmented reality, mixed reality, or see-through reality as well. And then the third big trend that I'm kind of interested in is how AI gets brought into virtual worlds. Oh, yeah. And, you know, <laughs> seeing the ability to for AI to create objects, create experiences, think about No Man's Sky, which is an entirely procedurally generated world. And now imagine, you know, Second Life being built at that scale with AI and procedural. Yeah, I uh, just before we came on air, I saw a BBC program, <laughs> not Boris. Um, it was um, called Click, and they had a special on AI. And uh, it really begins to get a bit scary when you realize that people are, are creating AI weapons you know, that could be more, da in, more dangerous than nukes, but no radiation or anything. They just have the intelligence to target individual people or individual races or populations or age groups, you know. Um, and, you know, I don't think it's been done yet, but the fact that it can be, whoa. But getting back to virtual worlds, I mean, I suppose one of the things with the, um, uh, uh, um, well, with the original high fidelity that Philip did, the 3D world, um, that did include blockchain style stuff in, in the backbone of its yep. operation. Um, so, you know, there was obviously uh, uh, something good there, but I, I think it was more, to me, I always saw it as a bit more uh, along the lines of authentication, um, you know, and value of goods. And uh, I remember in Second Life, for example, for a while, um, I think it was, yeah, it was, it was Brian Eno was in there for a while doing some sort of thing. And um, I got a limited edition Brian Eno moving painting on the wall. It just changes all the while. <laughs> it's still got it in Second Life somewhere, I'm sure. Uh, you know, this is supposed to be a real collectible, and I guess it is. But of course, I couldn't take it out of Second Life and bring it to Open Sim, you know, which is where I got all my, you know, big houses full of art and stuff. Um, so, you know, um, the issue here, let's move to this issue, in fact, the, the closed shop nature of um, some of what you might call the metaverse components. Uh, you know, um, Second Life is a wall garden, OpenSim is not, for example. Vicadia is not, but um, the the other high fidelity offshoot called Tivoli is sort of is a bit. Um, so, you know, some people want to be fully open and other people want to have their sort of little niche and you know co control the borders i suppose if you think of it that way um i, I if you're back on Dusan, are you got any thoughts on that wall gardens versus the open web or the open verse well i certainly lean more towards open but i'm not sure that everything will be fully open and so i actually think this is a really incredible opportunity to for creators and that can be the creator of a small world, or it can be it could be some of the larger players like um, Epic, which says that it's quite committed to an open metaverse. And what do I mean by being creative? I mean, one of them is the power of the avatar. And we see this with OpenSim. I mean, OpenSim has prototyped many of the things that people dream about for an open metaverse. We can carry our inventory from section to section, like from owner to owner within the open sim community um i i think that our avatars i have this concept that our avatars should carry around with them sort of permissions that rather than when we land in a virtual world needing to re read this big terms of service and privacy policy our avatar yeah. itself can be carrying around its terms to the world which the world can either accept or not so i'm you know, I think we're going to see a mix. I think we're going to see things like sovereign identity emerge. 
so that I can carry my identity from world to world, but each world may have its own rules about what my avatar looks like. Uh, I'd like to be able to carry my wallet. I'd like to be able to bring my, you know, bring my uh, currency with me from place to place. But that doesn't mean necessarily that I'm always going to look the same. And unfortunately, I don't think we're going to end up with one fully interoperable metaverse. I think we'll end up with a big swath of open interoperable metaverse and then a bunch of closed off. They'll call themselves metaverses, but in fact, they're just going to be closed off world gardens. But well, Charlie Fink refers to them as um, wolves with small lambs and the M, <laughs> capital, uh, you know, because you can't get away from the word, but, you know, you might as well contextualize it. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I'm tempted to think that's, you know, um, you know, if in the sense of the metaverse in its meaning is that, you know, that it be beyond actually is the dictionary meaning of the word meta. Um, you know, so metaverse is like the beyond verse as opposed to uh, the meat verse, shall we call it. Um, but I think, it, you know, it's always going to end up having to be, you know, small components. And I think like the web over the course of 20 years or more, you know, certain things are consistent everywhere you go. Whereas in the early days of HTML, you pressed on a link and you didn't know where you were going to end up or what you were going to get, you know. Um, you know, because people are still learning how to present themselves using HTML and whether it be VR, ML worlds or just text and graphics. So, um, I, yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of um the way things will ultimately go but um i don't know how much do you know about open sim here i mean um yeah I, I think you do because um you mentioned uh you didn't mention it by name but you referenced the hypergrid which of course is the system that uh krista lopes is in the audience here i think um designed and it allows you to teleport not to a location on a grid well you can do that too of course but to teleport to a completely separate grid as long as it's running open sim code um and the other thing that um fred buckhausen was talking about too which i've been using for a long while that's not online at the moment is i can have an open installation on an old desktop and that can be my home so when I want to go to an event, I can simply hypergrid out from my desktop to the event and then hypergrid somewhere else and then hypergrid back. And the beauty of that is that all my, my avatar likeness, all my clothes, all my assets completely reside on my own computer. They're not going to go anywhere. I, I can call them up while I'm out on the, you know, open sim hypergrid. Uh, to use, but I've always thought that this, <clears throat> as well as OpenSim itself, is an ideal template for a kind of future for metaverse. There's many things we've got that Second Life doesn't have, like NFTs and, and stuff, but the idea that it can be a base from which you can actually move move out. And, you know, um, obviously, if in the future we're going to access things on mobile phones, the fact that my, <clears throat> you know, um, my server is on a desktop machine isn't very helpful, but to get to my desktop machine, I actually log into the hypergrid and I loop back into my own world, if you see what I mean. But all, all the content and assets are actually on my own machine. Now, <clears throat> I think, um, Van, you can probably remind me of this. I think the landing um, point at um, the original High Fidelity used a rather similar system. You had a your your main address was sort of on your own computer and if you tried to do certain things it told you you weren't connected and couldn't <laughs> right you, so had a, you have a local okay. host which you still have yeah. um it, you know in vercadia um Absolutely. you know yeah. so i have a whole build there and then i also i rent a server from um digital ocean right. and then i have another world built on there you know so it's very it's convenient and it's cheap your assets are mostly, I store most of my assets up on Amazon S3. But yes, right. it's the same kind of system and um, everybody has their own world. I mean, I love the idea of a connective world. I still go into Second Life, get on my oh, yeah. horse, get on my horse and ride <laughs> around the mainland. I say, you know, and explore. You, you, you too, yeah. I love empty sims and the horses. <laughs> it's a chill out mechanism more than anything else. Um, 
yeah um no i think we we we, we all sort of love this stuff it's just sort of figuring out where it where exactly it's going um I mentioned that we had the um, Open uh, Metaverse Initiative on here uh, yesterday. We had Evo on. Evo. Uh, yeah, I know, and I know um, it's only been uh, doing, doing stuff on that front. Um, that tends to be, you know, sort of, I think there's game places because it's got a lot of different strands, different working groups and stuff. It doesn't feel like one big organization trying to do everything and build the future. It really feels like a disparate <laughs> sort of collective of people who really just want to build something that's open and uh, will um, work. Now, I, 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 the only thing I would give personally uh, Zuckerberg credit for is the fact what he's done, although I disagree with this and his interpretation of it, he's brought this to the forefront <clears throat> of people's awareness. Even people who never heard of Second Life or Virtual Worlds before over the last 20 years, I suddenly heard about, oh, there's this Facebook thing called Metaverse or something in there. <laughs> and, you know, he's used his power, as it were, to bring into focus. And I think it's a sort of crucial time in one sense, um, because if an open source project can create a sort of skeleton of something, um, that could maybe be taken up by a lot of people wanting a presence in the virtual world space, so to speak, um, then it could temper somebody like Facebook, who I know are saying they want to explore open, you know, systems and stuff, but they mean, you know, open systems. And if, if it's something independent and it works, they'll buy it. <laughs> so they'll just suck it up, you know. Um, I'd like to see something on a level playing field with um you know um facebook for or meta for one also um uh oh, what's its name um epic games and things like that otherwise we might end, yeah we might end up you know with um uh not monopoly but like a a, a conglomerate <laughs> who are literally running things and um battling it out like the the way in the general tech world you've got apple you've got google you haven't got facebook again you've got microsoft and amazon of course but you know after the first six or seven names you run out of names you realize that everything else <laughs> is on a level beneath you know and i i i think it's important for the future of a again metaverse to actually have at least one sort of structure that is an alternative to that. Do you think, I'll go for both of you here, do you think something like that is attain attainable? Obviously, it relies on cooperation and stuff like that, but do you think it's attainable? Uh, Fran? Yeah, I can speak. All right. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Well, you know, I think what Dusan said before when he was talking about the major points is is really relevant here. I think that the eventual evolution of the metaverse is going to be from um, headsets to spectacles to um, it being really more AR than VR. Um, people yeah. want to get up and move around and be mobile once this freaking pandemic is over. Um, and um, I think that, you know, he mentioned the dreaded AI but I think, you know, from AI, the next leap is machine learning, which is we turn everything over to the machines and they're doing, you know, and we just sit here and get fed stuff and buy stuff. But the real, you know, the real end point of that, as far as I can see, there could be an end point after that, is uh, what they call BCI, which is a brain computer interface. So instead of wearing yeah. spectacles or a headset or anything, you just have a node implanted in your brain and then all of the stuff is there. And, you know, I'm glad that I'm old enough that this horrifying endpoint will be after I'm <laughs> yeah. long gone. But, you know, I mean, I but, the same but, thing. <laughs> you know, but somebody who is yeah. five years old now, that's going to be their future. Yeah. You know, and Dusan mentioned the kids, you know, it's yeah. Roblox is, you know, they consider that a metaverse, the kids that are in there. Um, yeah. They're building everything. My view of metaverse, just to, to end with this, is um, metaverse to me is analogous to universe and all of the component pieces of it 
our worlds or, you know, sub worlds or whatever make up the metaverse. The metaverse is one thing and, yeah. um, you know, and that's, and I'm done. Thank you. I'm, Take I'm it away. Do a I might have reminded of Will Burns' model where he had, literally yes. has the first and then he's got meta galaxies and meta worlds and it, or the possible yeah. list is meta data, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, well, it's <laughs> Tony Parisi and the seven laws of the metaverse. There's one metaverse. Yes. Yeah. It's the all-encompassing. Yeah, uh, that, I would certainly agree with that. That's why I'm trying to avoid mentioning it these days because it's been misinterpreted so much. Uh, do Sam, thoughts on that? Or have we yeah, we almost have to get back to a couple definitional pieces here. Um, I'll say that my definition currently is I used to think that the goal of the metaverse was one giant virtual world that you entered like you entered Second Life and it had continents yeah. and it had the team grid and it had Zindra and whatever, right? <laughs> and that was certainly the model of Ready Player One and Snow Crash. I've come to change my opinion and to call the metaverse something that's emergent. And the reason I say emergent is that I believe that technology is trending towards being spatial. Yeah. Uh, everything from self-driving cars to the ability to use your phone to scan your shoes to three-dimensional product sites by brands to three-dimensional NFTs, whatever, all of these things are spatial. Our computers have, have gained the ability to see the world around them mm -hmm. and to present 3D graphics in ways. If you guys saw the Matrix um, mini game that Epic launched wow. to show off the Unreal 5 engine. Oh, it looks good. This I'm is hyper-realistic. It looks, you look like you're in a city. It has 35,000 uh, citizens walking around that you can interact with. It has thousands of cars and it looks hyper realistic. So computers have, <laughs> have gained, <laughs> computers have, computers have gained this ability to be spatial and to represent yeah. reality in increasingly realistic ways. That means that spatial content is emerging in all kinds of places. The metaverse is what happens when you connect all of those little islands. And I think those connections will happen because of resistance and friction points. I want to bring my avatar from one place to another. That's really hard to do. And so somebody invents a standard, a proper standard, a proper protocol for what avatar transfer means. Uh, so I don't think there's nobody out there building a single metaverse. The metaverse will emerge wherever. I like to say, if you want to log into the metaverse, just stand where you are. The metaverse will come and get you. Yeah, well, yeah. the metaverse will come and get you. Because they want to sell you stuff. <laughs> yeah, of course. Like, you'll be in Instagram. I, I'll tell you, this is my vision of one way that Facebook, now Meta, conquers the metaverse. You're in Instagram. A shoe ad comes up. You can rotate the shoe around. It's, like, really cool. And there's a little click. There's a little button that says enter store. I click that button, and suddenly I'm at a little, in a little three-dimensional store. And I'm in the metaverse, and I never even knew that I entered it. And I think that's how, yeah. you know, that's how we will see this interconnectivity play out. Well, that that is one of my thoughts. So I agree on there. That you know, the it, it's basically all the all these intrinsic parts that actually can plug into um, a spatial computing world. Um, you know, coming together slowly, and you know, organically, you know, we'll find out which work best and which don't. I mean. Personally, I can't stand the idea of being in a helmet for more than about two minutes, to be honest. <laughs> um, and I call them helmets, not headsets, because to me they are. Um, I look forward to glasses and smart glasses and things, because I, I have to wear glasses for reading, so I'm a bit used to that. But like I say, it'd be nice to have an implant where I can just, you know, I get, it use my like I use my leap motion to gesture. And on the web, I can just use that for flipping pages, like uh, in a flip book. Um, you know, so the, the tactile thing is there, but I think in the, you know, I need to be able to go to like a world here like OpenSIM and on a flat screen, but then when something interesting requires it, I need to be able to like pick up um, glasses or a headset and toggle it for as, much, as long as I need to do a certain thing and then put it down again and, you know, resort back to the flat screen. Those two need to be sort of interchangeable. 
given that the flat screen will be a 3D spatial environment, you know, it's still a flat screen that you're viewing viewing it through. And the same with, um, I, uh, it was, I think it was fiction, something in fiction I saw the other day, where um, a smartphone was literally um, reading infrared. And, um, you know, so you point, the, the character was pointing a camera at, I think, actually, I think it was a virus or something, actually. And um, the camera was able to detect it through different frequencies. So you might go in, as you say, with um, Instagram or something, you might go in to a site somewhere on a mobile phone and access some object or whatever. You might be able to, you might be able to buy it or be given it. And then the idea is that at a later point, you wouldn't even go on your phone to get that object. You drag it into your world. Uh, your spatial world or something. So, you know, um, yeah, all the little bits coming together. Fran on this one. Well, I don't, you know, Dusan, every time I hear Dusan, I want to like talk about the stuff he's talking about. I spent a little bit of a while learning Unreal Engine 5 because I, you know, I know that 4 is what they're using now, but I said, why bother with that? The future is 5. And I don't know if people realize that. They have two... Uh, tools within UE5, um, Nanites and Lumen. Nanites allows you to have literally a million polygons without lag. Think about that. Could you oh, build God, something yeah. here with a million polygons without lag? No. And that, and they can do that. So the realism is, is frightening. Um, and then Lumen is... Um, live lighting that does not have to be rebaked every time that you use it. But I don't think, you know, I'm, I'm with Philip on this one now. I don't think the future of the metaverse is going to be um, virtual worlds. I don't think it's going to be snow crash. I don't think it, I think it's going to take place as Dusan said, all around us and we can walk yeah. into it and out of it whenever we want. Um, exactly. You know, I played around a little bit with Spark, um, which is the um, AR for um, Instagram. And, you know, and it's fun, you know, gee, I made hearts come out of my telephone. Um, you know, <laughs> so, uh, you know, but here's my, 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 my final point on this is that those of us here are... Um, you know, let's be honest, we're, we're an older demographic. We have no freaking idea what this is going to be because um, we're, we're at, the, at the end of it. And um, the kids that are growing up now are going to be the harbingers of this. And it's going to be what they want, not necessarily what you or what Mal or Dusan or I want. Done. That's right. I just I just want to say the most um, I so I'm here I, I came for Art Basel which is the big uh, art event in Miami each year and it has been invaded by crypto people so yep. there were all kinds of NFT yacht parties and board apes walking around or whatever so that was whatever but to me the most amazing moment was walking past a school where there was a little lineup of kids to get into the school I would say maybe grade four and three of them had Roblox backpacks. Mm -hmm. That that to me said everything. That's the future right there. Okay, well, it looks like we've got about six minutes to go now. So um, hopefully my friend Leah is in this call somewhere. Are you there, Leah? Why, yes, I am. Oh, but I oh, haven't seen lovely. any questions coming in yet. But there's been a lot of oh. wonderful chatter, though. Yeah, Strong I know that's what I love about these worlds. The back chat. The chat. Yeah, so there's no direct questions coming in, just uh, it, it just reciprocal, reciprocal talk, as it were. Okay, back chat rules, yes, <laughs> indeed. Okay, well, we'll, 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 we'll continue with the five minutes we got left, I guess. Um, there's got to be a thousand things we haven't even started covering yet. Um, well, I didn't talk about um, Horizon Worlds. Is anybody interested in hearing? Because I've been in, you know, the closed uh, beta for that. Oh, and, and now, so now it's open. Yeah. Yes. Now, uh, well, yeah. Give us a little bit, not two minutes, maybe. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, 
my first comment, I, there are some positive things about it, but I'll give you the negative stuff because I'm sure you want that. I want <laughs> legs. I want legs. Oh, yeah. The legs yeah, well. all I am is an upper tour. So um, I asked the devs about that because they do have, you know, meetings where you can ask questions. Um, and they said that it really has to do with the complexity of uh, movement. You know, and and what they call the uh, the IK inverse kinematics, if you know about that. Um, it, it's, um, open, uh, Horizon Worlds is very primitive. Those of you who remember the early days of Second Life will say, "Yay, prims!" Because that's really how you build things <laughs> there. Um, one of the cool things, though, is when you build, you can make your avatar gigantic and look down on the scene that you're building. So it's almost like you're making a dollhouse and you can move things oh. around. Yeah, it's really kind of cool. And but and you can do that collaboratively. So those uh, are two good those yeah. are two really good points. Um the scripting also I am someone who I mean I can do a little LSL, but you know, as Marcus and other people in the audience Dale probably know I'm a horrible I can't code. And I can code in Horizon Worlds. It's visual scripting and you just move things around from a menu and you can make things happen, which I've never been able to do. That's a joy for me. But it's a closed, you know, as Dusan said, it's a walled garden for all of Mark Zuckerberg's talk about wanting to build an open metaverse. This is closed. And, I, you know, and I think it's probably only a matter of time before before the ads start popping up in people's oh, faces. Yeah, exactly. You won't be able to move for black hole dads. Well, that was Second Life in the early days too, I think, mm -hmm. wasn't it? I Ad farms. Say, yeah, Ad I farms. I appreciate what you said about the um, in in uh, Open Sim here and in Second Life for that matter. I always build and stuff like that as far as I'm able in camera. So I sort of take my camera up into the sky and pretend to be God and then terraform mm -hmm. everything and then come down to Earth and investigate what I've terraformed and think, oh, I made a cave there by accident, you know. Um, so that viewpoint you're talking about actually is is always I found rather rather kind of nifty. Uh, while we've got well, two minutes probably now, I'd like now to we have a question get... if you want. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, yes. The question that came in was from James at Loud, and it was for oh. Dusan. It said, "Would he make his point about non fungible tokens and prims?" Yeah, I think. So there's so many misconceptions about NFTs. One of them is that it is just a contract that points to a separate digital asset. So that's where you hear about art being sold for crazy sums. But NFTs are actually programmable digital content with many of the same features of the prim. Rosedale's prim allowed you to identify who is the creator and who is the current owner. It allowed you to attach licensing in the form of copy mod transfer. It allowed you to have a value so that you could sell that prim. And they were composable. One prim could be compo combined with another. Yep. And that's actually what the affordance of NFTs allows, but on a much broader scale, because it's not just, yep. a, you know, it's not just a box. It's all digital content. And so I think not, we're at the very, very early days of composable, highly util high utility uh, NFTs, and, of course, and I, I think over the next 12 months, we're going to see some really amazing innovations based on NFTs. Okay, and of course, it's not limited to any one world, so it's all part of the metaverse. Okay, um, we are actually out of time, so I'm going to hand to you again. Um, I'd just like to point out, um, I'm going to get each of you to give your Twitter handle before we um, sign off. Um, uh, maybe just put it in in world chat, but um, there's a lot of conversation going on at the moment. Uh, as we said, in things like Clubhouse, a bit of Twitter Spaces, meetings in Samsung, meetings in uh, Alt Space VR. We didn't even mention that one, the Microsoft product. Um, so, so, pretty good. Yeah. So, Ugly uh, avatars, good, good programming. Yeah. And as Eva mentioned, we have the OMI uh, channels on Discord and things. So um, I would urge you you know, to engage in the conversation, basically. That's it. So um, thank you, Doug. Or uh, do that, I mean. Amazing to be here. Sorry for my connectivity issues. It reminds me of the old lag days. I was having lag. Yes, uh, we remember those, <laughs> don't we? And uh, thanks, Dr. Fran, as well. Thank you for asking me, and thank you all in the audience. It was a pleasure. 
yeah, and I was about to say thank you, audience, as well. And maybe we'll be seeing you soon somewhere in the greater M verse. Thank you.